Okay. Let's get started. Chapter one. Okay, chapter one. The idea of of this class, chemistry and society, is basically where learning a lot of the eight chapters, eight topics around us. I mean, in our everyday life or around the society, and based on the topics, we're learning the chemistry concept and the chemistry language around it. Okay, so this class, I wish to say. 50% is, is, is chemistry, but the other percent is 50% is how chemistry concepts are related to what? To a society, to, to everyday life. This is how the classes are designed. And, and this, I have one of my favorite classes because, again, it, it shows you not only you're learning those boring chemistry concepts, you know how, how, how they are useful to us, how you're close to chemistry, basically. Okay, so this chapter, uh, chapter one, we're studying the air, we breathe, right? You just you breathe. Can take granted. I breathe every day. You may ever ask what what we're breathing, and what is the change before and after the breath, and also is there anything else besides something normally should be in the air, or, or not? We, we know there are pollutants, right? So based on this whole chapter, we're learning a lot of chemistry basic concepts based on the the, the air we breathe. Okay. So first is each chapter we list a few questions we want to answer. Okay, this, these are the chapters, the questions we want to answer for chapter one. What are the components that make up the air we breathe? What are the impurities in the air and how did they get there? And what are the healthy implications of inhaling these impurities? And how do we determine if air is safe to breathe? Uh, breathe? And, and are, they, uh, are there any harmful components or pollutants in the, in the indoor air we breathe in compared to the outdoor? And also, how can we do to limit the emission of the pollutants in the in, in the air and, and reduce that or, or policy wise? So these are some questions to think about, and we will address some of them in chapter one. Okay, first is what is air? Okay, what is air? Where it is? Okay, where it is? The air we breathe. Okay, every breath. Normally, it's defined by the part of the atmosphere here. You can see that in the scheme. Uh, by looking the altitude is what between zero to eleven miles or that kilometer, kilometer miles miles I think right but between this region okay between this region and uh, in chapter two we're actually studying this region as a kind of stratosphere this one it's got troposphere okay if you guys guys study geometry uh, I mean, sorry, not geometry geology you probably gonna study these terms but here is the part of the atmosphere we're talking about in this chapter for the air we, we breathe. And that basically, that's the part of what? Where we live. Okay, where we live. And uh, first, in order to study the air, we first understand, you need to understand a concept called matter. Okay, what is a matter? The reason we, we need to study this concept of matter is because chemistry, this subject, is the study of matter. What is matter? Matter is everything that has mass and volume is considered matter or, or in the scope of, of matter. And, and you may ask, I think, is that, does that include everything? And do you have to even talk about? Here, I, we give you a few examples of matter and some non matter or, or, or subjects or non matter terms to compare to the difference between matter and non matter. Here are examples of matter, plants, soil, rocks, air, bacteria, atoms, no matter how big or how small they are, basically everything around you can see, I and mean, sometimes you cannot see, are sturdy class of matters, as long as they have what? They have mass and occupied volume. Anyone wonder then what else, what doesn't have mass? Here are the ones that aren't classified as matter. Heat, light, electricity. They are considered as energy. They're not matter, matter. And chemistry is the study of matter and also the properties, including chemistry property and also physical property. Okay, physical property. So, first, when we study matter, we classify matter because there are so many of them, right? There's just everything around us are, are matters. So we have to classify matter. And the first type of classification Okay, classification is classified matter by what? 
by state, by physical state. Solid, liquid, and what? Gas. Okay, apparently the air we breathe is what? Gas. It's gas. Okay, it's gas. So air is a gaseous matter. Okay, gas. Why again? Why we classify them? Because they are how they exist in nature, and because there are so many of them, and we can after classification we know what's what is the unique about solid and what is the difference between solid versus what liquid and liquid versus gas. Here, let's, let's take a list of some differences. Okay, for example, solid, it does not take the shape of a container, it has what? has a definite volume. It does not take the shape of a container. Okay, it does not completely fill the container. The volume is definite. Right? And the shape is also what? Definitely, that's how solid looks like. On the other hand, liquid, it takes the shape of the container. It does not feel complete the container. It depends on how much liquid you have, right? If you have this much liquid, it does not fill in the whole, the whole container. And also, it does have definite volume and also does not have definite shape because liquid, right? If you pour it, this container to a, to a bowl, to a plate, it will take adopt different shapes. It, on the other hand, gas, it totally fills what? The container. No matter how big the container is, the gas is going to fill there all in. If you open that up, you will fill the outside of the container. So here this table shows you what the difference between three states. Okay, three states. And there's a link here. If you open that, you note later on after that if you study. There's a link. You can play more. Sometimes there are some interactive uh, videos or, or pictures or some software for you to, to play with to further understand three different states. Okay, again, the air we breathe, of course. I guess. As a matter of fact, most of the substances we study in chapter one, I guess. Why? Because the word studying what? The air we breathe. Okay, we breathe. Now, air is a matter, gas matter, but it does not contain only one substance. It is called a mixture. Okay, what is a mixture? Mixture is a physical combination of two or more substances in variable amounts. Okay, there are a few words we're going to explain by this definition. Mixture is a physical combination. What does physical combination mean? Physical combination means the components in the air under normal conditions do not react with each other. There is no chemical change happening. They're just physical combining. They exist without changing their composition. Okay, they can peacefully live together without what? Without interacting with each other. So that's what physical combination means. How, what is the invariable amount? The variable amount means air in South Carolina may be different from what? Air in, in, in Georgia, in, 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 in New York City. Okay, there's difference. Even though they're, the air is the same air in the troposphere, but what? Different cities, they have different components. Okay, there are variables. So, variable amounts. Okay, so these are key terms when we talk about the mixture. Okay, take a mixture. Mixture, later on we're going to see, is another type of classification matter. Remember we're talking about what? Matter. Matter classified in liquid, gas, and state. And also matter will be classified into mixture and something else. But first of all, air we breathe is a mixture. Okay, it's a mixture. And if you look at these two charts, the pie chart or the, the bar chart, okay, the same, they're basically giving the same information. Dry air contains two main gases and some other gases. Two main gases are these two, nitrogen and what? Oxygen. 78% is nitrogen, 21% is oxygen. That's almost the same across anywhere on this planet. Okay, almost the same, around 70% and 20%. The total together will be 99%. So that means there is 1% of other gases. Okay, the 1% of other gases. But the main components are these two. And the concentration of these two, 70%, 21%, won't change much. Do Maybe we, uh, slight do we know what the other one percent is, or is it just kind of? We know. We'll talk about. It. Yes. Good question. Yes, we know what they are. And again, there are some other components. These are them some variables, right? Maybe in one area, gases in this percent is more than the other. But these two concentration is related. 
relatively stable. Okay, that because we're adapted to these two concentrations, nitrogen 70%, oxygen 20%. Again, this also shows air is a what? It's a mixture. Okay, air is a mixture. Next, this this flow chart shows you another and more important classification of matter. Like re remember, we study matter. We need to classify them. Otherwise, it's too many. Matter are classified into these two big types. Mixture, like air, and what? Pure substance. Okay. What is pure substance? Pure substance is just what? A single substance. Nothing else. Matter, mixture is what? Two or more pure substances what? Physically combined together. The invariable amount. You get it? So, for example, air is a mixture. But if you pick out nitrogen, for example, in the air alone, nitrogen is a what? Pure it's a pure substance. There we go. Okay, pure substance versus what? Mixture. Okay, easier term is mixture is what? Combining. Again, physically, they not, cannot react with each other. Okay, it's a different, that's a whole different story. Number, pure substance is what? Just one single substance. That's a very plain, straightforward explanation. Okay, not the way to understand it is that if I give you a sample, you ask yourself, does this sample has variable components, variable comp composition? For example, if I give you a cup of coffee, what do you say, mixture or pure substance? Mixture. Mixture. Why mixture? Because apparently, again, straightforwardly, we know coffee has what? Has water, has, has cream, has, has caffeine, right? as those coffee being extracts, everything. That's a mixture, right? But if you think about it, coffee, the com components, concentration, or, or the components amount of content is variable. Even Starbucks, they make coffee, right? Chain store. One person makes a cup of coffee and he makes another one the same. Will be what? Will be different. There's no way you can guarantee two cups of coffee are identical. Why? Because that's how mixed are defined. The components are variable. The contents will be variable. Even the same person makes two coffee at the same time. They follow exactly the same instructions. Trust me, if it's a mixture, it will be the same. Okay, the, the will be different. The component will be different. But pure substance won't. No matter you're talking about nitrogen here or nitrogen on the other other side of the of the earth of the planet. We're talking about the same thing. The Content or, or components or composition will be not not variable. Okay. So that's the classification. Now let's take a look at mixture because air is a mixture. It's a mixture. Mixture can be further classified into two types. Okay, into two types. One type is called a homogeneous mixture, or sometimes people call it hom homogeneous or homogeneous. Another type is called heterogeneous. What's the difference? The difference is whether the mixture has one uniform visible face or multiple faces. Okay, you may say, what, is it? what do you mean face? A glass of iced tea. Do you see multiple faces or just uniform? The whole bottle of a glass is uniform. Which one? Uniform, uniform. or not? Uniform. If it is uniform, then, if iced tea is a mixture, which is a tea, iced tea has what? Sugar, has tea, has, has, has caffeine, etc. If it is uniform, then iced tea is what? Homogeneous mixture. Uniform, one visible face. If you put oil and water together, what happens? It's the will separate. By life experience, you know that will separate. And, or I put some sand in water, you know sand will be what? In the bottom, right? And those are all, both are mixtures, sand and water, oil and water mixtures. But the whole thing is what? Heterogeneous. It's heterogeneous. It's not uniform, right? It's one part contains more than the other oil, or one part yeah, is more sand. And then if that's the case, we have poor, more visible faces. Then we'll talk, what, talk about what? Heterogeneous mixture. So by looking, by the appearance, you can tell whether a mixture is homogeneous, homogeneous, or Okay, let me ask you a question. Soil. Is soil a mixture or not? Yes. Soil is definitely a mixture, 
the soil has rocks in it, has worm in it, right? You have have moisture in it. Is soil a homogeneous mixture or or heterogeneous mixture? I say heterogeneous. What is heterogeneous? Because you can usually see the different different parts. Different layers, right? If you cut cut the soil in pieces, you maybe for example, the top of the soil is drier, the bottom soil is what? It's more moisture, right? It's wet. So again, it's not one in Homogeneous mixture. Uh, it's a heterogeneous mixture. Okay, here I'll show you. See, iced tea, homogeneous. Iced tea with ice will be what? Will be heterogeneous mixture. But, more important question Is the air we breathe, we know it's a mixture already, right? Is air is homogeneous or heterogeneous? Homogeneous. Homogeneous. Because it's what? Uniform, right? We don't see one piece of air more dense than the other. We have all across the classroom, it's the same. Air is a homogeneous mixture. Very good. Question. Which of the following is a homogeneous mixture? Gas. Gasoline is a homogeneous mixture. Right? Gasoline, you see, if you put a put a gas a glass of gasoline, you will see it's actually clear, uniform. But gasoline is a mixture. Okay, gasoline is a mixture. At least you know it contains what? What does it say on the on the gas gun? The the what does it say? You guys put gasoline every day. What does it say on the on the? There's a label always there, on the the gum. Oh, um, um, ethanol. Contains what? Ten percent up to ten percent of what? Acid. Yeah, at least contains ethanol in it. That means it's not all gasoline is ethanol. Okay, we can we'll talk about that actually in chapter four. So gasoline is a homogeneous mixture. Okay, and by the way, when you see question like this, I just want to bring it out. To you. In this class, I would never or very rarely ask you guys. In the test or quizzes, give me a definition or write down or memorize a whole paragraph, write an essay or something. Your questions will be on asked in a way how you what understand these definitions. Okay, if you know, hey, I know what is a mixture. I know what is the difference between homogeneous and heterogeneous. That's it. As long as you can tell it in your own language correctly, you can answer this question. That's good enough. You don't have to tell me word by word what we show in the class. Hey, what is mixture? What is a homogeneous mix? What is the what the difference? You don't. You, you know what's the difference. Then you can make a what? Make a determination if you have a live, real sample. That's how you apply the concepts to, 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 to quizzes and exams. Okay, that's the how, also how you, I know you what you understand. Okay, next. Air is a mixture. So here list the gases in our breath. In one breath, what are they? Okay, nitrogen, of course, seventy-eight percent is a gas. Nitrogen gas is colorless, odorless, very stable, okay, unreactive. Nitrogen is basically the inner gas in in the in the air. Okay, it doesn't change much. It's always seventy-eight percent. It doesn't change much. Normally, living things do not take oxygen, nitrogen, except some nitrogen fixating bacteria. Okay, bacteria. Otherwise, nitrogen concentration is very stable. Okay, very stable. It's the inner one. Next, oxygen. Okay, 21%. That's something we use a lot. Right? Not our body uses oxygen, but also what? We all use oxygen in what? When we need burn fuels, right? Remember, you burn fuel every day. You, 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 you burn fuel when you cook, you eat. You burn fuel when you drive a vehicle, right? You need Oxygen. Okay, oxygen. Okay. Or when we uh, when we use oxygen, we use the same way. We burn food, right? To, 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 to grow, to live. So oxygen is something we use a lot. Okay, the reason why oxygen concentration maintain 21% is because of what? Because of photosynthesis. Plants make more oxygen. We use some oxygen. And then the concentration maintain 21%. Okay, very nice. And because we use oxygen to burn food, our body uses oxygen to burn food, we, we take some oxygen into building our, our, our body environment. And also because our body is composed of water, mainly oxygen is the most abundant element in the human body. Okay, we're, we make carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, but if we're talking about percentage, oxygen has the highest percentage in, in the human body. Okay, those are 99% already. What are the other gases? One of the other gas, 
less than 1% is carbon dioxide. Okay, carbon dioxide is mainly from what? From burning carbon-containing things. Food is a carbon-containing, no matter you vegetable or meat, there are carbon-containing substances, matters. And when you use oxygen to burn them, you will release what? Carbon dioxide. That's why when you breathe out air, you actually produce what? Carbon dioxide. And when you burn gasoline in your car, your car is also emitting what? Carbon dioxide. Why? Because the fuels we study in chapter four are also carbon-based fuels. Okay, so our carbon dioxide is produced from food metabolism in the, in the process of respiration. Okay, and besides that, we also, air contains a gas called argon. Okay, gas called argon. We don't have a craft tape here. And water vapor. Okay, and water vapor. Sometimes, if we're talking about moisture air or human air. Okay, this chart shows you the composition of inhaled air and exhaled air. You guys take a look. What is the main difference between inhaled and exhaled? Which two concentration change the most? Oxygen and carbon dioxide. Oxygen and what? Carbon dioxide. Which also gives us evidence what? We, we use absorbed oxygen to burn food and the oxygen will combine with the carbon we food and take breathe out what? Carbon dioxide. You can see that the carbon oxygen concentration dropped 5%, but the carbon dioxide concentration will be what? A hundred times, almost a hundred times of the one you breathe in. Okay, these are the difference between inhaled and exhaled. But you can see the nitrogen concentration as well. The same. Why? Because we don't take a nitrogen out. Nitrogen, like I said, is an inert composition. From from seven thirty-five to eight fifty. Next, uh, the composition of air also depends on where you are. Okay, we're uh, not only here. This picture shows you, of course. These, if we look in these pictures, mostly we're talking about what? What composition? Water vapor, right? This is moisture, moist human air. This is what dry air. But there are other composites, other factors like human activities or, or, or ge ge geology inf information. If you live close to water or live close to to mountains, etc., those things can also affect the composition of water uh, of air. Okay, and uh, that's so far we talked about mixture. Air is a mixture and the components of air, but we're talking about ideally what the components are. But, okay, but if you look at this image, right, this is the image of Beijing. Okay, I lived in China for, for 20, 20, 25 years. And I've seen this because I studied in Beijing for six years. Every, when, every spring, this is very typical. Okay, you don't see anybody, even it's right in front of you, uh, during spring especially during March, April, and, and May. And that means in addition to nitrogen, oxygen, argon, carbon dioxide, each lungful of air you, you inhale contains what? Other things. Okay, contains other things. And those other things cause these. Okay, cause these. So, why we have those? Why we, besides those not like a regular or normal components of air, why do we have those other tiny components. Two reasons. One reason is natural events. Okay, natural events means what? Even without human activity, sometimes say it's all because of us. We do. Yeah, of course, there are some human activities, but natural events will also contribute to the other tiny components of air. Okay, other than normal air. So both reasons contribute to the tiny components. Now, in order to study what they are and what are the regulations on those tiny components, we first need to take a look. How do we quantify them? We saw tiny, right? What is tiny, right? This, we need to know how do we give a number because we're talking about harmful tiny components. We need a number to regulate them. Hey, this is the, the threshold. Your tiny component of A, B, and C cannot go over a number. So first, we need to take a look. How do we quantify the components of air? 
and the components of air is quantified by using a term called concentration. Okay, concentration. What is concentration? Concentration means for a component in a mixture, how much is this compared to the total amount? There are three levels. The first level is the one you're very familiar with, it's called what? Called percent. What does percent mean? Per hundred. Per hundred means what? It means if the total is a hundred, then what is the component you're talking about? How many of those? 21% of oxygen in the air means what? Per hundred molecules, atoms, whatever in the air, there's 21 of them should be what? Should be oxygen. That's what 20% one of us mean, because per hundred, there's 21. Per thousand will be what? 220, uh, 210, etc. Okay, so that's called percentage. It's one of the con concentration term. And it's perfectly great term if we want to describe what? Oxygen and nitrogen, because they are what? They're the major component. However, if you want to describe some tiny component, for example, like I said, the harmful air pollutants, you cannot use percent. If we use percent, the number will be too small. Okay, if, if the concentration of, of those tiny things increase to percent level, we all, we're all gone. Okay, the, the Earth won't be a, a, an inhabitable planet. So in order to describe the smaller, tiny amounts, we need a smaller concentration unit. These two. But the idea is the same. Percent is parts per hundred. Here, ppm means parts per million. Per hundred means what? Per a hundred. Per million means what? Per 10 to the sixth, per a million. For example, midday ozone, ozone is air pollutant, we'll see that in a few minutes, levels reach out about 0.4 ppm. It means what? It means during that midday, out of a million molecules, no matter molecule of atoms in the air, I don't care, I think a million of them, 0.4 will be what? Will be ozone. You can say it's a tiny, right? Out of a million, there's only 0.4. That means it's a minor, tiny component. The same idea here. Say sulfur dioxide, which is another air pollutant, in the air should not exceed 30 ppb. Ppb B stands for what? Billion. Means out of a billion molecules or atoms in the air, the amount of sulfur dioxide should not be more than 30. Do you see that each concentration term is what? Smaller and smaller and smaller. Which one do we use? Depends on what? Depends on the real concentration. It depends on your real concentration. But again, they're all the same concept. Out of the total amount, what is the component we're talking about? Okay, in order to show you, okay, in order to show you when do we choose which concentration term, we have to practice a couple. Okay, and this after this practice, you you've had a better idea, hey. Why sometimes you use percent? Why sometimes you use PPM? Or why sometimes you use PPB? Okay, this is very useful practice for you. Okay, first, I'll do the first one here, and then you guys practice the B at home. Okay? Hey, it says in some countries, the limit uh, for the average concentration of carbon monoxide, which is an air pollutant, in, in, it, in an eight hour period is set to nine PPM. And the question asks you, can you express this 9 ppm as a percentage? What does it mean? It means ask you to convert 9 ppm to, to percentage. Okay, how do we do it? Here is the logic. Again, I put it here so that you, you have your notes. But again, this question is very important. You will see that similar one in your quiz and test. Okay, I want you to be able to freely come convert between these terms. Again, they're all concentration. It means they're the same. The only difference is you need to decide which one to use. Or sometimes you need to convert one from another. And which one looks better. If we're on a, on a, on a chart, hey, I want to regulate air, air pollutants, which one should I put in the chart which looks cleaner? Okay, for example, here, the question, 9 ppm. 
Okay, how do we convert? First, okay, first, 9 ppm is a concentration term. You convert it into a number. ppm means what? Parts per what? Million. Per million. That means you convert to 9 per what? Million. Per million. That's what ppm means, right? Now, 9 ppm is translated into a math, is a fraction now, right? See, 9 per what? Per million. And the question asks us to do what? Convert to what? Percentage. So that means the per million has to be per what? 100. Per 100. So what do I change a million to 100? I divide what? 10,000. If I divide this guy to 10,000, I cannot change the number. I can only, what, what? The only thing I should do is what? Divide both top and bottom by what? By 10,000. Then that means I didn't do it because in 10,000 cancel, the number still doesn't change, right? I cannot change the con concentration is still 9 ppm. That's for sure. So if you want to change a million to 100, then you divide 10,000 on both. This one divided by 10,000 becomes what? 100. This one divided by 10,000 becomes what? 0. 0.0009. Done. Because this is now what? Per 100. Then I just translate it into a, into a symbol of percent. 0. 0.0009 what? Percent. So this means what? 9 ppm is 0.0009%. They're the same. You can see they're equal, equal, equal. But now tell me which one looks nicer. 9 ppm. And that's why for the concentration of this guy, if you want to talk about 9 ppm looks better. Of course you can use percent. It's not wrong. It's just for a small concentration, use percent, you have a lot of decimals and zeros, which is not as pretty as very, very common. We'll see this again when we talk about water contaminants as well in later chapters. Okay, but here I want to give an idea how do we convert between these two. Okay, you can practice as well. It's very similar. I ask you to convert 70% to ppm now, just backwards. Okay, see if you can do it afterwards. Okay? Now, here is the sum of another way, which, which I don't recommend, but when you want, once you get familiar with it, you can do that too. Uh, just basically ask you to move the decimals. You want to compare the percent to PPM. Okay, here's for example, 0 0.0402 PPM means, move the decimal, uh, means 0 .4, uh, 0 0.0402 parts per 100, right? Percent means what? Per 100. If I move the decimal to the right, means per thousand, more one more right, means per 10,000, one more right means per 100,000, then one more right means Per a thousand thousand means what? A million. So basically means if you want to convert percent to PPM, you move the decimal to what? To the right four places. You see that? One, two, three, one, what? Four places. You convert percent to what? To PPM. Okay, and if you want to move it back to percent, you need to move the decimal here to what? Back to four, four places. And again, either way, okay, either way. And normally, in a quiz or test, you will see that after the first test. Some questions, I, I want a straightforward answer from you. Some question, I need you to show me the, the work. Okay, show me your rationale, like, like here, the previous one. This is how you show, show me the work. Okay, and there will be instructions on the question as well. If a question asks you to show, show me the work, I will say that, show your work. Okay, so that means you cannot give me an answer. Just directly. Okay? So these are concentration terms. Okay, concentration terms. I think we can stop here. I don't wanna okay, let's get one more and then we'll stop. Okay, we'll stop. Sorry. Okay, here. Uh, after we know the concentration, here listed four of the tiny components that makes the air not much livable as we want it to be. These are the bad gases. Okay, bad gases. We'll study them in detail next class on Thursday, but here they are. Okay, including what? Carbon monoxide, formula is CO. Ozone, formula is O3. Sulfur oxide, formula is SO2. 
the nitrogen oxides form it as NO2, and another one is called PM. The full name is particulate matter. Okay, PM. Okay, these are the bad gases that are the tiny component there. And next chart shows you here, I don't know which year this is, what maybe the most current version is the US ambient air quality standard. Okay, standard. Show you the regulation of these bad gases. You can see that. For example, carbon monoxide, one hour average cannot go over what? To 35 ppm. Eight hour average cannot go above to what? To nine ppm. What does it mean? It means longer time, you should get a small percent. Shorter time, sometimes, for example, uh, carbon monoxide, for example, in the, in the morning, rush hours, right? The, a lot of cars, the, the air concentration, the carbon monoxide may be, a, might be what? Maybe a lot higher. But during that hour, for even rush hour, it cannot go above to what? To 35. But if you're looking about, uh, let me say a whole day, eight hour average, cannot go above to nine ppm. Okay, the same, you can see the threshold, okay, threshold for all these and bad gases. And these are the concentration, and they'll call you the another concentration converted to cut a microgram per uh, meter cubic. Okay, and they're all the regulations. Okay, regulations. And uh, there's a quick something for you to think about. Okay, think about based on that table, can you can you conclude or can you guess which of the substances in this table is likely to be most toxic, exclude particular matter. Let's finish this one for you. Yeah. Which one do you think? Use the, exclude the PMs. These are the PMs. Which one of these pollutant do you think is most toxic? Ozone? Yeah, probably ozone. Ozone, why? Because it has the lowest, the standard is the lowest, like it shouldn't go above that. Standard? It's a really small amount. Okay. I think you're right. The logic is right. Ozone. No, sulfur dioxide. Because it's around this it's really low, just like ozone, but over a smaller so. If you're talking about that, your rationale is correct. The thresh is lower means what? More toxic. So if you compare ozone and, and carbon dioxide sulfur dioxide is what? Ozone is lower, right? This is 0.07, this is 0.075. Or would it be lead? Lead. Is what we're talking about. I, I didn't even read that. Normally, for standard ppm, it should be what? It should be zero, three mm -hmm. miles average. And you can see the concentration needs to be what? Less than 0.15. It should be zero, basically. Okay, especially nowadays. Okay, United States will be studying later chapters. United States used to have lead in the gas. But during maybe 20 years ago, they phased them all out. So there should be zero lead in the atmosphere right now. And because why? Less is too toxic. Okay, so if we're talking about, I think, Lead should be the most toxic ones uh, for document the year and it exclude PMs. Okay, again, these are some questions to think about. Okay, think about and we'll continue. Okay, we'll continue on Thursday. All right, sorry guys for the for the tour thing and uh, I'll ask them on tomorrow.